All right, good morning, everyone. So welcome to Thursday. Today, I am super excited to have a guest, but first I had a few, few pieces of business to take care of. So the first was, remember last, yes, last time we talked about Dagger, was this algorithm that could iteratively collect data. And I realized after the class, I kind of mangled the description. So I wanted to just go back and correct myself. So in particular, we were talking about how we're going to use this data. And the line of the algorithm I got wrong was here. So what, you, what they were doing here is saying, with some probability, I'm going to either use my own policy or ask the expert. So what you could do here is say, initially, I'm gonna set beta i to one, and the first iteration through, I'm just gonna ha ask the expert how to act. So that way, it doesn't matter how you initialize the policy. But then you get that data set, and then you, ch you decay beta. So the next time through, you get a combination of acting on your own and asking the expert for help. So over time, you rely more and more on yourself. But after all of these iterations, after each of these times you collect data and act independently, you can ask the expert basically for corrections. So say, hey expert, I got into this weird part of the track, what should I have done to recover? And then you're going to get all of that data together and use that to get your next classifier. So that was, that was the part I flubbed. What I had said last time is you immediately start following your policy and get data from the expert to help you there and then just continually ask the expert. This is a little more elegant where they rely on the expert at the beginning to get some decent data because you could imagine if you start with a bad policy, it might take you a little longer to get going. Okay, so with that correction done, now I get to introduce you to Dorian. So Dorian and I have known each other for just a few months, but he is um, an entrepreneur that helped found the startup AIR, so AI refined, redefined in Montreal. And Dorian also has shipped 17 video games, which makes him a hero in my eyes. Um, I, video gaming is the main way I unwind, in, in addition to hanging out with my family. Uh, I can't play first person shooters, but I really enjoy strategy games and tactical games. So I'll also mention that Dorian is an active member of the Montreal AI ethics group. So depending on where this discussion goes, there may be time after, after Dorian's presentation to, um, talk, to talk a little bit about AI and ethics and how human in the loop affects that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Dorian and say again that when you have questions, uh, please feel free to, to unmute and jump in. There's also the Dorian Q&A um, channel in, uh, at least I thought there was. Uh, yep, there's Dorian Q&A channel in Discord. So if you'd like to ask questions there, that's totally cool too. So Actually, I will let Dorian take it away from here. Let me connect to Discord. I think I haven't connected to Discord. Well, hello everyone, do you all hear me well? Uh, yep. I'm actually familiar with Edmonton. I, I used to live there <laughs> prior to living to Montreal uh, because one of the company I work for during my uh, video game of a life <laughs> was uh, Bioware. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I'm familiar with the U of A quite a bit. <laughs> uh, used to live in Strathcona. now. Um, so let me, let me grab, uh, okay, here we go. This is good. And let me share now my screen. All good. Um, so for, for the quick format, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is maybe a presentation of overall 20 to 30 minute ish. Uh, and, uh, and it's mostly honestly to have a base. So actually after that, we can have question and conversation, which I found always the most interesting. Uh, uh, m the presentation is really going to be art well, uh, oriented into four pillars. I'll describe a bit what the company is. Uh, and basically who we are. Uh, then I'll describe really the problem that we've been tackling. Uh, then I'll talk about our technology. And finally, I'll talk about the application. So, so this flavor is like 
uh, plenty of content basically to discuss. Uh, and uh, there is a bit of everything in that presentation, you know, uh, a bit of business, <laughs> a bit of technical, a bit of like uh, application. So it's, it's varied. Anyway, so, so let me start. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, so I'll talk about uh, human machine collaboration and, and AI redefined in general. Uh, so quick description of who we are. We are a Montreal-based startup uh, that was uh, founded in 2017. Uh, we are 14 person right now. Uh, and, and yeah, the, the company used to be called Age of Minds and a lot of people say this feels too much like a video game. So we change it for air, uh, <laughs> for branding and size, which is a, a, a bit more refined. Uh, what makes us unique is, is not the fact that we are an AI company. There is a lot of AI company. There are a lot of people with AI proficiency nowadays, more and more, which is good. Uh, what makes us really unique is we have a lot of people who are at the intersection of AI on one hand, one hand and I'm taking AI as the more uh, general efficient. I'm not only limited to machine learning. We have obviously a lot of people doing machine learning, but I'm including things also like semantic network in this uh, and uh, and more symbolic AI in general. Uh, uh, and and the second one is what we call the field of human machine interaction, which you found mostly in two domains, which are video games and simulation. Um, so a good example of that, or actually two of them, is our CTO. Uh, he used to do machine learning applied to cybersecurity at Google. Prior to that, he was doing uh, uh, air, uh, airplane simulation. And like 15 years ago, he was working at Capcom Vancouver on Dead Rising, which is zombie games. Uh, uh, I have another partner of mine. He used to be one of the pioneer of semantic network in the early 2000s. Uh, he did the war anthology of the uh, Library of Congress in the US, which is still one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and then, you know, I work with him directly on the Mass Effect series at Bioware, uh, and he's been a, a game executive. Uh, I mean, if some of you have played uh, uh, Star Wars uh, Squadron, which was released recently, he's the guy who started the whole project. Uh, and so, uh, and so, yeah, I have a lot of his profile, which are kind of in between video game simulation and uh, and, and AI in general. And so, non surprisingly, what we develop is at the intersection of both, right? Uh, and is called Cogment. And Cogment is really an open source framework uh, that helps you do really uh, large scale training uh, with human in the loop. And I'll be talking uh, a lot more about that on the, on the technical section. Uh, uh, the way I describe it in a vulgarized way is Cogman has been built to design, train, and deploy complex intelligence ecosystem that will have a mix of human and artificial agents of different kinds. Um, so let me talk about the problem or what are we exactly trying to solve? Um, there are certain situations uh, that are uh, really good fit for artificial intelligence uh, because you have often a human that is uh, facing a problem that, uh, I don't know, you have, for example, too large amount of data or level of complexity that's just too difficult to integrate quickly for human, but where, you know, a pattern matching algorithm will make perfect sense. But at the same time, the situation, for whatever reason, um, it's too critical to be entrusted by an AI, uh, usually because these are life or death situation. Uh, uh, and so, you know, two example that we, we found often uh, uh, are a good example of a situation is the first one is medical, uh, where uh, you wouldn't have a surgeon replaced by a machine in any situation, or at least not until five or another five or 10 years. There's a lot of regulation to come in, uh, just because the trust is not fair. But at the same time, the human body is a perfect example example of a very, very complex machinery where playing AI yields some really, really good results, right? Um, uh, another one is a, a, a bit more, uh, uh, another life and death situation uh, is uh, pilot or piloting, for example, uh, some of the latest fighter jets, right? Uh, the complexity of the machinery is way beyond human understanding, right? Uh, and actually using AI uh, to have a better understanding of fighter chest itself is, is really key. At the same time, you absolutely don't want to have a life or death dec decision or a decision of firing missile thing like that be done by an AI. You want that still to be driven by humans, right? And so 
in all this sort of different situation, your ideal scenario is to have a collaboration between a man and a machine, right? Makes sense so far. The problem is, as you probably <laughs> will, uh, well know, is in the domain of machine learning, if you look at the vast majority of how agents are trained, they're very much trained without the implication or involvement of a human, right? Uh, the very last, major, well, vast majority of supervised learning problems are, well, it's, it's mostly about seeing pattern large quantity of data. You kind of have a human involvement in the labeling of the data, but I don't know if you could call that really a true active involvement of human. And, uh, and, and in reinforcement learning, which I found already a lot more interesting, uh, because by definition, enforcement learning, you have the agent going at superhuman speed in order to do your 4,000 years of human chest in a few months, right? You cannot really also train with a human, unless that human is Superman or Flash, which I haven't found yet. Uh, you're, you're, you're kind of limited, right? So a current technique don't really have human involvement in, in terms of training, which is a big problem. And reversely, uh, uh, machine learning is by definition a black box. Uh, people of our design and training, the agent are already not really always sure and, uh, or capable to understand what is happening and you come in even, even a lot less. So when you think about it, all the conditions to establish a meaningful and real collaboration are actually non-existent, right? And so, so yeah, that was where we started like, well, we need to do something about this. And, and so uh, our aim is really uh, to, 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 to find the common point between collaboration is to have a common experience. Uh, and, 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 and in order to have, uh, we wanted to create this common experience where you can have not only uh, uh, an AI that is learning from the human, but the human is also learning from the AI. And so this is really what kickstarted basically the, the reason of being of a company and, 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 and what we're doing. And so now I'm going to take a bit more of a, of a technical hat here. Uh, when you think about common experience between a human and a machine, or uh, you think of a few things. Uh, the first one is learning by experience or by a process of trial error really sounds like reinforcement learning. So maybe we have a, a good starting point there. And learning with a human, well, that's pretty much human in the loop, right? So, so when you think about it, what we're having here is a human in the loop reinforcement learning problem, right? And, uh, and when you think of human in the loop reinforcement learning, uh, what you've seen probably a lot through paper or different things that have been done in the, in the past five years is, is your first thing, thing is to, to look at having the human give a sort of bias on the reward function, just, just to, to, to help uh, the, the agent learn better, right? And so there's, there's plenty of example of, of basically model, model that are converging faster just because the human is, is basically impacting or function. No, no, don't do that, do this, right? Uh, and, and so this is obviously the, 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 the kind of first layer and most obvious way to do uh, human balloon post learning. Uh, but uh, what we really want to do is more than that. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and the way we're thinking about the problem is a bit more complex one, is we're thinking about it as a special case of multi-agent reinforcement learning. And why I'm saying a special case of multi-agent reinforcement learning is, is, is as if some of this agent actually happens to be human, human that are acting as agents. This is really how we're formalizing kind of a problem. Uh, but with that, we're, quite a few challenges that go with it, right? Um, uh, the first one obviously is, is data scarcity. And, and more specifically, probably when you're dealing with human is, well, you're first limited by the humans you have at your disposal, you know, in terms of quantity, but also at the speed they're going. Like I mentioned, we don't have Flash or Superman yet, right? So that's a first problem. Uh, and so, uh, because of it, uh, so that's that's the first element. The, the, the second element is is uh, a human will always have a different state, right? Uh, let's imagine you're training, uh, I don't know, uh, an agent in understanding emotional intelligence in a human, right? And, uh, and you're using human with loop RL. And uh, uh, I know it's trying to, to, to understand anger and 
does something to anger the human uh, so it learns and then you cannot say to the human hey could you go back to the state you were like five seconds ago when you were not angry i just want to try something different right <laughs> you cannot do that right so 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 in short you have to deal with uh with the fact that human will always be kind of uh, in many ways unique and there is no reproducibility in what you're doing right which means you'll need to collect lots lots of data and be very liberal in how you keep it because you don't even know which data will be relevant or not right uh, the third thing is uh, you you also want to kind of leverage as much as possible your human your human can provide you much more than just uh, you know bias on your reward function uh, uh, it, it can um, I mean it can be helpful in showing alternative uh, to the agents. Uh, uh, you can use the human to do imitation learning. Uh, you can use the human for a lot more elements than, than, than just the bias. So don't limit yourself in how you're using the human. Um, and finally, uh, just something I wanted to mention also, and, and this is kind of a belief we have, we don't believe uh, into just only one specific uh, training method. There are many and there'll be new ones coming up also in the future, so we want to be future-proof. Uh, but uh, ultimately, you know, reinforced learning is just a mean to an end to train a policy. <laughs> and if you have other ways to train a good policy, then just, you know, use those other ways, right? Um, the other problem you have is there's really a lot of moving pieces uh, between the environment, the agent, uh, uh, the user interfaces, uh, all of that happening over a network. So it's, 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 it's very easy to stumble into general engineering uh, complexity. And, and finally, uh, another thing to really not underestimate is how you present that to the human. This is a bit more of a video game part or human interaction part that's going to speak here is 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 you know human are fickle they get bored easily they get annoyed easily <laughs> they get distracted easily right and and when you think about you know agent you've been training uh you know human get bored quite quickly by something that is really stupid and ai agent are really stupid, probably in the beginning of your training. It takes some time before you have something that is, you know, uh, a bit meaningful to interact with. So how do you deal with that? That's, that's, uh, that's not a small challenge. Also, be very careful about how you design the UX that you're having with the human, because uh, I don't know, if you, if you have a pop-up that says, did my agent do well or not? The end metrics that you'll have won't be an agent you won't have really the metric of an agent doing well or not. You'll have the true metric of how quickly can I close the annoying pop-up because this is what the human will try to get rid of, right? So you need to, you need to think of element like this, right? <laughs> uh, in, in how you design your UX. So uh, getting into how we're solving this, right? And, and the way we're solving all this problem is there's really kind of two parts to them. Uh, the first one is the actor abstraction I'm going to talk about, and then later on the microservice architecture. Um, so actor abstraction. What we mean by actor is in the framework that is uh, called Cogment, uh, 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 an actor can be a lot of different things. It's not limited to being a machine learning agent, right? Or learning agent. Uh, an actor can be a script. Uh, an actor can be some traditional heuristics. An actor can be a human, obviously. This is one of the purpose we have put a system like that. You can even do fancier thing about an actor being actually the consensus of a decision between multiple other actors, for example. And so uh, you can do kind of uh, a fancier training with that. And, and what is really key here is that all those actors are interchangeable, right? And because you have this, all those actors that can be interchangeable at any time, this is where it enables really a space of expression topology that is really large. So let me take a few problems. Let's, let's start to solve a bored human problem, right? So a human is bored by interacting with an agent that is stupid. So how do you deal with that? Well, you make the human interact with a script that has some semblance of intelligence, but already the human is interacting with something that is working a lot better. In the meantime, 
you have a learning agent that is observing how the script of a human interact and is learning from it. And once you reach a certain level of maturity, then it hot swaps directly uh, with the script. And you can do then another machine learning agent that learns from how now the new machine learning agent is interacting with a human and then also hot swap at the same time. And so what is interesting is that from a human point of view, it only sees an intelligence that is growing as in reality, we're just hot swapping actors, right? Um, Another problem is, you know, we're talking about not having a large quantity of human. Well, yeah, that, that is a common problem. So, but you can bootstrap an agent by having, uh, again, could be a script, could be something else, something that tries to emulate what the human is, right? And you can start to bootstrap your agent on that. And then as you're getting through the training process, then you, you add progressively human as they are available and keep on the training, right? Um, now you can do also plenty of other things. You can have a situation in which uh, the agent is doing something and whenever the human is not happy, it can literally take control of what the agent is doing. And then basically you're kicking off imitation learning, right? And the agent is just going to observe what is the human doing? Okay, well, I should have done that and learn from it, right? Uh, and, and finally, you can do some really fancy things. Uh, this is one thing we had on a, on a defense project is, um, so in, in, in kind of a latest in the world, we're starting to reach a point where we're capable now to assess in real time, the cognitive load of a pilot, right? So basically how mental charge he is. Uh, what you can do with that is you can use that as an input for the training of your agent, or even better, you can use that as an input to determine the level of autonomy that the agent is going to have, right? Uh, because when the pilot has a really low cognitive load, uh, is very much in control, it doesn't really want the AI agent to take too much initiative. Uh, so you'll just limit the level of autonomy of the AI agent. Uh, reversely, uh, all hell breaks loose, <laughs> all the plan go up to Wazoo, cognitive load is just immense. This is the moment you want to have your AI agent just take as much initiative as it can uh, just to get the, the human pilot out of a bad situation, right? Uh, and and we, I love that as a source of data because, uh, uh, you know, there's two types of feedback you can get from a human. There's the explicit feedback, like, you know, after a debrief or something like that, but the problem with explicit feedback is, is you already have kind of uh, uh, the own bias of a human as implicit feedback, like the cognitive load, or you know, it could be the heartbeat or whatever else are just fantastic because they're just really per, pure human data. Uh, and so you can do some really interesting training on that. Um, and so now talking a bit more into the engineering part, uh, uh, we needed to build all of that in a way where environment and agent can be all distributed at any time. Uh, and, uh, and we wanted to build also an area where it's very easy to go from the world of testing to prototyping, to development, to deployment, back to testing, back to prototyping, and also in a very seamless way, right? Uh, and so this is why we decided to go really with the microservice architecture from day one. Uh, and, uh, and these are some of the great feedback we had is people love the fact that you can, your environment is the same basically between the test and the deployment, and you don't have to redo multiple setups like you would have to do with no pay gym, for example. So that's pretty much gives you Cogment, right? Uh, there are a few other interesting things that are happening also within Cogment. Uh, as part of a distributed training, we have a system in which you can have the same agent is learning a distributed way from uh, multiple human interaction at the same time. So imagine that you have a video game with a million player, you can have the same AI agent learning from the million player in parallel, which gets you plenty of data without having to go through the acceleration of time as a solution. Uh, and, and, and the last element is you can very easily build, uh, uh, can do an agent architecture 
that is using multiple methods where you have a mix of heuristics mixed with RL, mixed with other elements, right? Uh, and and overall in, in our team, we're very much, probably when you come to deployment, we're we big believer into uh, multiple methods uh, solution rather than just being only driven by a large neural network. We don't think that we're any way close to be there, maybe in 10 years, but not now. <laughs> Um, so, what are exactly the application of a, a technology like this? Uh, well, uh, this is a really ugly graph, but it tries to uh, to, to give you a bit of an idea of, of what it enables. Uh, is is thanks to the sort of tech foundation, there are really five type of feature we can do. Uh, the first one is interfaces, uh, human machine interfaces that naturally adapt. Uh, this is a really good use case of human in loop uh, RL. Uh, doing customized synthetic data, that's another thing that we can do and easily create through simulation. Uh, having a continuous and adaptive learning. Uh, Real-time recommender. And finally, like I mentioned, with a case of a cognitive lobe dynamic autonomy. And so today we're using that really in kind of six domains, uh, anything that touches the notion of smart cockpit. So obviously uh, anything that is plan related. Uh, the notion of smart dispatcher uh, that you find in air traffic management, that you find in logistics, for example. Uh, man machine fleets. So I'll be a bit more precise on that is whenever you have a fleet of vehicle that have a mix of human operated and some other that are autonomous, and you want the autonomous one to uh, not only be autonomous, but kind of operate uh, in, a, um, in a cohesive way with a human. Uh, you need to have large scale human in the loop solution. Uh, threat and general anomaly detection. Uh, we're basically assisting a human in doing that. Uh, a very recent one we're exploring is that notion of having a, a, a video game AI director, but it's mostly driven through ML. Uh, so for people who know a bit video game, think of kind of uh, left for dead AI director, but on heavy steroids <laughs> uh, with ML instead of uh, your, your traditional rule-based system and the in general semi-autonomous ecosystem. Uh, so I'll give you a bit more detail now on, uh, on some of his use cases. Uh, so our very first project, we didn't really want them to come from there, but just those were the only people who wanted to pay for technology like ours were coming from defense. Uh, so our first one was in uh, anti-submarine warfare. Uh, it was a mix of basically uh, submarine drones and human operators uh, that are trying to detect as quickly as possible uh, 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 a, a submarine. And so what we learned from that project is two things. Uh, the first one, uh, there was the obvious uh, bias on the reward given by human operator, and you had basically a model that were converging faster, uh, but that you probably already know. Uh, but the other one was just that uh, AI and human really better at different things. The AI would be reacting and seeing pattern uh, uh, in the information a lot quicker than a human would. Uh, but at the same time, they're, they would be easy to trick where a human judgment will be able to see that, no, no, this is a submarine, even if you don't see it, right? Uh, so so it's, it's a really good case of actually human mission collaboration. Uh, the second one uh, is on collaborative air combat. So these are the uh, a mix of fleets of uh, uh, human operator and uh, machine operator vehicles. Uh, it's here, uh, the, the proof of concept we worked on was the penetration mission. We had basically uh, uh, four drones that were kind of escorting a fighter jet uh, for a sort of equivalent stealth mission uh, and uh, helping the fighter jet basically avoid radars. And what is really interesting here is that uh, bad behavior from the fighter jet were used as a reward of, well, as a penalty for the AI agent. So basically the AI agent is learning based on what the human is doing. So it's, it's learning to uh, uh, interfere a bit or kind of try to adjust the human behavior, which is uh, super interesting. Uh, uh, third use case we had, uh, uh, this one, I, so I have a bit of a story for this one. Uh, uh, it started about a year ago. It originally started with uh, uh, the city of Hong Kong. Uh, what they're facing as a problem is uh, they, the equivalent of the 911 operators, basically, who dispatch you know, all the emergency services. Uh, 
Uh, the problem they had is they knew by data that those people can handle three incidents at the same time. And after that, we're starting to do mistakes, basically, right? And on average, a Hong Kong operator was handling seven <laughs> incidents at the same time, which is obviously not good. And it was not something they could just solve by adding more people. And so we're really looking into machine learning uh, as, as, as a way to solve that. And, and Hong Kong, a bit like Singapore, is very modern in terms of infrastructure. They have access to a shitload of IoT. We didn't have access to drones that go to the incident place or things like that. Uh, and they have a simulation and a digital twin of basically the uh, uh, city. Uh, so they have uh, an actual simulation we can do training in. Uh, but yeah, all the data they had for traditional, all the results they had for traditional machine learning way were, were really not conclusive. And so we really wanted to explore the human in the loop uh, aspect. And so, so we helped them on that. We didn't do uh, real life training. We all did that on simulation with, with some real interesting result uh, because basically uh, the, the I was constantly relearning from what the human is doing and the human could basically say, well, no, you shouldn't do that. You should do this. Uh, and, and so it was getting a lot more of the expertise from the human. Uh, so sadly, we're not able to move forward with a project because uh, Hong Kong has been a bit, uh, 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 was, uh, I would say, relationship between Hong Kong and China are bad and relationship between Canada and China are bad also as well. So, uh, so we, we keep doing that project on, uh, internally now and we've been repurposing it to a Singapore project. And we're planning also to give kind of a sort of uh, first responder training to put that on the web so that anyone can actually play with it. So thinking a bit like a sort of serious video game. Uh, so this is something we're working on and hopefully we'll have that done by uh, the end of the year. And finally, uh, as COVID hit us in March, uh, we were looking at how we can help. And, uh, and, and so we, uh, we realized actually that there was uh, something that uh, was a lot more complex than what we thought and was a good place actually to, to apply the sort of combination between uh, a, a human and AI was uh, everything that is smart bed management. Uh, so you would think that actually, uh, you know, bed are easy, there is someone on it or there is someone not on it, it's a zero and a one problem. So where the hell the problem is. So. Uh, uh, first data that when I learned it, I was like just shocked is uh, there is something like 90 people every year in Canada that die because uh, people were not able to found them in the hospital. <laughs> So, you know, someone that was at a bed that has been moved to another bed and then someone forget or get the run medicine or thing like that. Like there is like plenty of stories on that and that number was like, holy shit, wow, that's, that's crazy, right? Uh, and, 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 and when you add the, 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 the COVID pandemic on the top of it, there's a lot of complexity. You don't give a bed like this to someone. There is, it needs to be sanitized. It needs to be clean in a different way, depending on who the person is. Uh, you need to manage also another flow of capacity at moments. So how do you deal with that where you have less beds? So it becomes very quickly a complex problem. And the way they're dealing with it right now is just, uh, people talking to each other in taiki woki and walking around the corridor, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's very, very weak. And so what we propose is to do a sort of centralized system uh, for basically all the bed management, have an AI recommender very similar to our smart dispatcher, help to dispatch all the bed solution, but constantly loop with the human so that, you know, it's not making bit mistakes or <laughs> because those are, again, life and death decision uh, and learn from the human expert. So yeah, I mean, as, as a quick recap, you have uh, a company who created basically an open source framework uh, that helps you really design, train, and deploy complex intelligent ecosystem between humans and artificial agents of various kind. Uh, and if you want to play with it, it's open source, it's free, it's meant to be played with, so here you go. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Dorian. Um, so we've got a number of questions. I think the, the first one that I also had is, it seems like estimating the cognitive load of the human or humans in the, situ in the, in the um, uh, situation could be really important. How do you do that? And how do you know that that estimation is correct? 
Sorry, I reconnected my headset because oh, it's sorry. run out of uh, battery. <laughs> <laughs> no, all is good. So, so yeah, cognitive law, how are they doing that? So I certainly cannot go into detail because these are defense people doing that. Uh, but uh, it's a mix of a lot of different type of body monitoring devices. Uh, so they have a sort of pilot connected to plenty of things. So I know they're measuring heartbeat. I know they're measuring kind of a skin tone and other elements also as well. Uh, so there's a lot of a sort of element. Uh, they observing the eye and the movement of the eyes is I think another metric also uh, in part of judging the cognitive load. And then there's a series of things that the person is doing or not doing, but give them insight also of the cognitive load of problems. So basically they, they, they taking all those inputs uh, and they have, they have actually algorithm that are basically determining uh, what, uh, what is the, the level of cognitive level of a person. And then we're using the result given by the algorithm as an input for our own algo. I see. Yeah, because we, we had a guest speaker earlier in the semester, um, uh, Kyle Mathewson, talking about these different physiometric inputs and how you know the holy grail is getting the internal human state. And typically you cannot directly measure that. Uh, yep. But if, if you're given that as an input, that would be amazing. Uh, he, he's, uh, Corey is absolutely right. I, I need to contact him, by the way, because we share a similar passion. So this is actually, so Corey talked to us, but also his brother, Kyle, um, oh. does, is a uh, psychology professor here. And he does a lot of like EEG stuff. And he was talking about measuring heart rate, gaze, all of that. I should introduce That's you to awesome. him too. Yes, absolutely. You, you're, I, I love it because uh, our, our biggest investor are uh, people who are at the intersection of neuroscience and they have several neuroscientists Ooh. and yeah. machine learning and they have a few people uh, on machine learning side. So that's really the thesis is, 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 is the transformation of human in general. Uh, uh, but yeah, you are a hundred percent right. And now I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a sign note. Uh, and I know the Elon Musk is a bit of a flamboyant person with plenty of crazy thing, but I'm actually a big believer into neural laces uh, as solution to, to get actually a level of implicit input to that is absolutely crazy. Uh, uh, I think we're still far away from that, probably you know one to two decades away to things that are really mainstream in that regards. Uh, but this is, this is going to change a lot in probably the human loop training aspect. Absolutely. Um, this is probably bad, but I would, I would really like to, to succeed possibly at a, at a different company with someone who wasn't, had a different personality at the head. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, another question a few people had was thinking about the, the hot swapping. Yep. So, so for, for instance, you were talking about how uh, people in AI have different strengths. Uh, maybe you want to save the human data more because it's more important. But if these are switching over time, can you really get, get those strengths? And if, if all of a sudden the human is interacting with an agent and then the agent changes, won't that throw the human off? And vice versa too. Uh, no, these are very, very, very good point. Um, it's, it's still a more subtle change from what we tested than going from a fully non-trained agent to a fully trained agent. Uh, and so humans are very adaptable. So I'm less worried about human adaptability as a skill, more as I am about uh, human uh, boredom or distraction or other elements. As long as the human is engaged, even if the human is confused and need to kind of readapt, you're still getting a valid interaction from the human. Okay, so you, you have more faith in people than, than some of us do. <laughs> I've know. seen, I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen really funny things. The, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going back to my video game industry. Uh, all game that you do, you always try to predict what the humans are going to do, and they, they always surprise you. It's, <laughs> it's a constant, you, like literally constantly. I, uh, the first uh, 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 Mario 64 on Nintendo uh, for people who remember that game. Uh, I, I love that as an example because in that game you could 
basically take penguins and throw them. Uh, and you know, this just to give me a thing, they found in their first test group when they show the game, the very first thing that human were trying to do it was to grab the penguin and trying to throw them off, you know, into uh, uh, out of a sort of floating island. Uh, and and they're just focused on trying to do that and ignoring all the rest of the game. So yeah. <laughs> Well, that's interesting because when uh, a few days ago we were brainstorming about different ways to teach uh, agents or robots, and one of the things you could do is just throw the robot off the cliff, and then very quickly it learns that that's bad. Don't get thrown <laughs> off the cliff again. Yes. <laughs> um, so another another question was was thinking about what should be controlled by the human. So it, I'm 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 paraphrasing here. So please please interrupt me if I get your question wrong. Um, but the the idea you were saying, well, you know, you you wouldn't want a robotic surgeon, okay? Um, you probably wouldn't want the the missile firing without a human, okay? But is that is that a, a line you can always draw, or is there some kind of gray zone that would change depending on different circumstances? I know this is going to be a really application I love, specific I, I know, question. It, it, it's 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 no it's it's actually a really really good good question, and 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 I'm going to be a bit provocative in my answer. It's not at all based on the quality of the agent. Sure. Your agent can be absolutely fantastic. You could have the most ethical agent in the world that is shown to be more ethical than ninety five percent of the most ethical person, thing like that. If there isn't a trust between the human and the machine, it will just never happen. Uh, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you a true story. Uh, it's uh, uh, related uh, to the European Space Agency that has been using for several decades uh, an old machine that already did a thousand different mission because they fully trusted it and didn't want to switch to the new machine, which was proven everywhere to be more reliable just because they never went through a single mission with it. And we're talking about hardcore scientists, right? We're not talking about irrational people, right? And we're talking about people who are putting their life when they go to space and they're still using the older version that is less reliable because from a psychology point of view, I've been on a mission 1,000 times with it. It never failed me. This new stuff, it looks awesome, but yeah, I don't trust it. <laughs> and, uh, and it was actually one of the very rare examples where astronauts did a strike when the, 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 the leadership tried to impose the, the new solution. Yeah, so and it's really we, not about statistics, it's about trust. It's absolutely not about statistics. It's entirely about trust of elements. Uh, I'll take a very simple one because this is one that is inevitably going to happen is self-driving car, right? Uh, eventually self-driving car will be deemed, uh, let me start with a level four self-driving car problem, which is like, we have a car that is safer on the highway than any human driven car, right? It's demonstrated, it's demonstrated in simulation, it's been tested into multiple circuits again and again in plenty of different situation. The majority of human will still not trust it. And we'll probably be driving it, letting it drive, and they'll start to trust it, not the moment the stats are fantastic, but the moment they'll be like, yeah, I've driven 10,000 kilometers of that car, not a single thing ever happened to me. It avoided three large accidents, I'm fully trusting it. It's again going back to that common experience, right? And, and, and this is something we tend to really underestimate partly, uh, partly in general. I mean, I remember in my AI fix group in the beginning, prior to having people coming from philosophy background, sociology background, uh, psychology, we're mostly machine learning people. And, and it's, it's crazy how, how just naturally we have, because we have that bias to look at this sort of statistical problem, we just totally forgot that humans are just deeply rational beings, right? <laughs> and that basically, you know, <laughs> uh, it's not only about <laughs> the, the, the machine quality. Well, that's really interesting because just, just a few weeks ago, uh, a couple of 
guys, I think early 20s, got caught sleeping, or at least with their chairs fully, seats fully reclined as the Tesla was speeding down the highway. You know, it, and they, they jerry-rigged the system, so it did that even though it's not supposed to let them. So these are people going the other direction, trusting the system way too much. So how, if, if we know people are not perfectly ra rational, how do you get them to trust a new version of the system or how do you get them to trust a new system? Is it just experience or could it, could it also be, uh, could you transfer that experience? So if, if I grow up seeing my parents using a self-driving car, then I will just automatically use a self-driving car. I don't even question it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. So transfer experience, but I think it's in general sharing experience. And you can do that in, in, in also a uh, non-direct way. So let me give you an example. Uh, these are things we've been doing in training pilots. So uh, 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 Airbus has been working on a project. This is a public project. It's called Disco, where the notion is to have basically uh, 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 a virtual copilot, right? And the idea is not to put the virtual copilot mainly, like no pilot will accept it, but uh, everyone who is piloting a plane trains like crazy amount of hour in plane simulation, right? And so what you do is you have them train alongside an AI, right? And so they're having in the simulation, those experiences with the AI or the virtual copilot that saves them their life on tricky situation or do things where the pilot comes out of it like, well, I haven't flown in reality with that AI, but it saved my butt at least 10 times when I was training in simulation. Let's give it a try, right? Because there's already that uh, common experience. And I, I think simulation art games are a great way to start to have this common experience. Taking back to the surgeon is like uh, you, you're doing directly training on simulation of operating on a body with the help of an AI. You build the trust well progressively, and then you start to bring the solution to reality. Uh, usually, uh, I like to see in those complex sensitive projects, you really have three, three phases. Uh, you have a phase of uh, the simulation or virtuality, but common experience. Then you're moving to one of augmented reality. What, what you're doing is you, and still is already starting to have a bit of reality, but while still minimizing the risk, right? Uh, so for the surgeon, it could be in a real operating room, but with uh, uh, a not real human body, for example, right? And so uh, you are kind of in a mental health solution and then you're moving into a, uh, a reality in a very progressive way. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting training scenario too, thinking about do you, use a normal distribution of tasks or do you try to pick tasks where you can highlight where this agent will be most useful cases where you are personally likely to make a bad call um, and it, it that might build trust faster or it might feel like you're cheating and the person feels like he's just being manipulated by your system yes yes very true and and any I mean, there are pros and cons for both, right? Uh, uh, also having one element that is a good pain point, pain point of a human and building fantastic trust on it, then you can almost go to the reverse where the human is assuming that the machine is capable to do a lot more than it actually does, right? Yeah. So, I, so switching gears a little bit, um, uh, Scott, Scott was asking about bed management and he was saying that there's really a lot of personal decisions. So, so trying to like keep two patients that don't like each other apart yeah. or balancing nursing workload. So it, in that case, it's really this multi-objective problem that, where yes. there may not be an optimal solution. So does that make it better or worse for a human AI team? Um, I think it makes it... Uh, better for a human AI team because the fuzziness is something that the AI on its own will have a very hard time dealing with, right? Uh, and, and, and most of the time, the human will be bringing kind of new constraints that we were not at all into the sort of game the AI was trying to optimize, right? Uh, uh, reversely, we know that the only human solution right now is not really efficient. We have a lack of human resources, so they are already overwhelmed. They're making bad decisions, and they're making bad decisions also not 
fully understanding or seeing what the data is, right? They'll be moving someone to another bed, not realizing that the consequences for a cleaning crew and everything that goes after will then put someone who is supposed to have an operation in 10 hours from now in jeopardy, right? They won't calculate that. As VI would have been able to calculate that. So I actually think the bed management, very similar to uh, the, uh, the submarine scenario, is a really good scenario where you get the best of both worlds. And, and that's why recommender system are the best way to do it. Uh, because uh, uh, the human can override them at any moment saying, oh, no, 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 no. Like those two nurses hate each other. <laughs> that will never work, right? And VI will, totally didn't think about it. And at the same time, on the other hand, uh, uh, there's just too much going on to not be facilitated by an AI. Uh, I have another example, very similar to bed management, is uh, is on the uh, the smart response. So uh, uh, the 911 operators. Here's one reason it likely won't won't be automated until a very long time. When someone calls you and is like, "Hey, um, I like to order a pizza, please," right? Uh, the AI will be like, "Well, this is a false number. Thanks, bye." The human operator will be like, "Oh." The person likely cannot speak with me right now. So they're trying to give me a hidden message and let the person talk and realize that maybe the person is in death danger or whatever else and trying to guess from that. Good luck to train an AI to do that. Well, you know, it's an interesting problem and we'll probably succeed at doing it at some point. But for now, humans are a lot better at doing this, right? Uh, but reversely, assessing what is the optimum route based on traffic and a lot of other elements like that, humans are crap at that. <laughs> Just let me do it. <laughs> well, that, that kind of comes back to the, the trust and automation question. So it, you could have the completely human su system. You could have Skynet, where it's just completely automated. And it seems like over time, as these human AI systems, as the AI gets better, it seems like the human would have less and less need to participate. So it, is, that, is that the right way to think about it? That we, we, want, we want to think of this as a flexible system where you could give less and less control to the human? Or is there, for a particular problem, is there some kind of optimal level of human involvement, regardless of how good the agent is? You, oh, you I love that question. I don't have the answer to it, but I love it. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so here are the thing. Uh, there, there are very much two, two kind of direction this can go. And I'm looking at now, looking even more to science fiction as a model for, for reference on that, right? Uh, some science fiction book will describe you AI system as reaching a level of perfection where human just cannot equal them in any way, any shape or form, right? Some other science fiction book, a really good book if you like science fiction is all the Ian Banks cultural novels that describes a human machine society, to be honest. The majority of the machine are vastly better to do many things than humans, but there are certain situations where we still need, even the mastermind need to have that sort of human that will be given input, insight, intuition that the machine could not think of, right? Uh, because, and so the way they explain it in there is that uh, because humans are incapable of pure randomness. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that distinction between the machine who is capable of utter or pure, purely <laughs> pure randomness is what makes the humans available. Again, thinking here, science fiction book. Um, the, in, in any case, what is good about human machine uh, collaboration problems is that it will become more and more apparent if there is an area in which the human is systematically better or there's something human that makes us unique or if at some point we'll, we'll just be exceeded in every different domain. So I think this is why it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, from, it's, it's a lot better way to solve the human AI alignment problem in the long run than having a system that are developed in an autonomous way and human doing their thing separately. Yeah, so I like that. But th thinking about what is the human good at, what is the relative performance of the AI, but not just task performance, what about overall alignment with the, with the end goals? Um, so even if the AI is at higher performance, you, in order to keep them aligned with what the system really is supposed to do, the human might never be able to leave the loop. Yes, absolutely. And I, I'm a big believer into building uh, 
uh, building a healthy codependence between the two. Uh, and, is, is, and is that an oxymoron? I thought codependence it, it, was a bad yeah, thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is an oxymoron. You're absolutely right. But I'm trying to... Dependence implies a negative notion automatically, right? Uh, yeah, a strong but, collaboration. Yes, <laughs> it, it's, it's that notion of a full loop where, where the yeah. human is learning from the AI as the AI is learning from the human, right? Uh, so a code benefit, I guess, would be maybe a better word. <laughs> nice. Oh, interesting. Um, so uh, one person, Brad, was talking about he, he works in uh, medical clinic management software, which, which I also did for a couple of years. Um, and I saw this. So he mentions that adding a mouse click to a process is a massive controversy. I remember when we were <laughs> you know, having to get, this was a while ago, but making sure doctors knew how to use a mouse. Um, so one of the problems is if you have a system that is changing over time, or is more or less transparent if the humans are unaware of, uh, of this change or because a, a lot of people are, could be quite resistant to changes in their routine, but we as machine learning people think that, well, I think as a machine learning people, person, you always want an adaptive interface, an adaptive system to get that highest level of performance. But, but maybe in some settings, that's not what you want. Maybe comfort, it, uh, uh, keeping things as constant as possible is actually one of the objectives. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I can give you an answer on that that is not health related. And then I'll make a little note around health also as well. Uh, yes, it's the case. In defense, it's the case. So for example, drones flying information, there is no reason to use machine learning whatsoever. Right, you want to have them try fly information, a specific distance, they fly a certain way, and that's about it. And these are good example of actually you using just realistic system. They do the job, they do them really well. You don't have to use ML, and you just switch to ML at an over time, right? And this is what goes back to uh, why I believe hybrid system probably in the situation today are some of the best system because you can get the best of ML when it's needed and just rely on other system when it's not needed, right? Which could be the case for, for healthcare. Now healthcare is more, so smart bed management in the end, we ended up not being able to work on it for, for reasons that you'll see will make a lot of sense, but uh, uh, health is weird. So my, my wife worked for like 10 years in St. Justin who is uh, the, the children's hospital in Montreal, really highly reputed one. Like, uh, they have some of the latest technology to keep uh, 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 a baby born too early, for like that, but things that are like of 2018 or 2020, some crazy medical technology. At the same time, they manage the hospital like we used to manage things like 40 years ago, right? And, and they're living in that sort of, uh, yeah, real world where things are insanely old and some other things are insanely new. And sadly, anything that touches bed management or overall management is just extremely old school. So it's, it's very difficult to, to move uh, to higher level of, uh, of technology or to, to do that sort of four years jump. Uh, another area that I absolutely love is education. When we started that company, some of our first projects were really education oriented, right? And, and it's the same thing is you realize very quickly that a lot of schools are managing or using kind of uh, a recommendation of teaching that are 30 years old, where there have been already plenty of studies showing, well, no, this is not the way to do it. Here's all the data. And you try to bring them into the, the next 10 years future, it's, it's just not working, right? <laughs> There's just too many pre-steps to do, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, some precondition here is, well, First, get everyone to digitalize the data. It's crazy that I have to say that in 2020. I would assume this was already happening in the 90s, but it's not the case in the health system. Once this is fully there, then start to get your people to be used with having technology around them in a way they don't have right now. Uh, get them used to have some form of touch screen that shows all the bad that they can touch, which they obviously don't have right now, right? And only then can you start to talk and think about adding an AI recommender. Nice. So there, there was a, a question from another student, but I'm going to let, let him ask um, and, and stop talking for a while. 
Yeah, hi, Dorian. Um, I just want to ask, I know on one of your slides, you mentioned one of the five applications was customized synthetic data. Can you elaborate on that? So, uh, yeah, I, I can take a, a few example. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I, I'm again going to take a bit uh, uh, the, the defense use case. Uh, it's really difficult to get real data in defense, right? Uh, 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 for some reason, actually, as the people working in space, you don't go to space every day, you don't go to war every day, you don't have a lot of data on that. This is why they rely a lot into simulation, right? And so what you do is that uh, you use basically uh, uh, your uh, ecosystem that is mixed with human and machine to create, elaborate and different scenarios that will then generate data that you can then use for your training that will then generate data and you start to enter sort of a positive loop, right? Uh, and so so basically uh, you, 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 you kind of bootstrapping uh, uh, a generation of data through simulation. And, and by using machine learning agent, you have a better representation of what human or enemies or system could do basically. Yeah, is, is there any way you can give maybe a more like um, precise definition? Like, I'm just wondering how the human helps in generating the synthetic data. Um, so, you need to have uh, you need to have starting points, right? Uh, so uh, one example we had uh, was uh, well, a very good example was just a human doing a series of things that we're just trying then to imitate to eventually create an agent that is representative of that human doing. Uh, uh, they used to call that. How did they call that? Uh, not digital twin, but something similar, like a, a sort of human twin, or whatever it is, right? And so basically you're building that sort of virtual human twin that is trying to mimic everything that that operator is doing, right? And one is doing it in a satisfying way. And we're just talking here about imitation, then you can use that to represent multiple operators, right? And then now you add other humans that will be trading alongside them. And that's when you start to get some better data. Interesting. Because one, one of the things we've been thinking about, so and on Tuesday, we talked about an algorithm where you get some demonstrations from a human, try to summarize that human as a policy, and figure out how to use that to bootstrap uh, RL. But it's a way of saying this, this data that I got from the human is really important, and I'm going to treat it differently from other kinds of data. Yeah. So like you, another thing I think people might have done already is to get some data from a human and train a generative model to try to create more human-like data. And if you can try to do that bootstrapping, that human-like data won't be as good, but it could be better than the data that the agent gets naively interacting with an environment. So th thinking about how it, we've got this human data, how do we make it privileged? How do we recognize that it is very important and treat it as a different kind, a class of data, and that, but then still recognizing that it's suboptimal and eventually we can discard it? Yes, yes, that's very true. Another thing you can do also as well is once you have a sort of representative of your human, uh, you can do multiple variation of it and have it reviewed by humans so that the human decide which one is the most human, right? And you do a sort of selection going this way uh, until you have something that, you know, basically satisfies uh, uh, the human. Uh, so <laughs> it, that's very, really interesting. There's plenty of topology and things you can do. Uh, you can also hit plenty of walls while doing those also as well. <laughs> well, because we, we, know, we know humans are good at, at preferences. So if, if yes. you show them two things, they can usually tell you which one is better. Yes. Um, so if we could generate a bunch of these pretend humans and then look at how they act and let the human guide that, or you could think of it like a population-based search uh, and finding, finding good uh, 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 pseudo-human examples, that could then go and then maybe generate a ton of data for you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Cool. But yeah, in short, there is plenty of way for this topology to just create your own data. Uh, and this is probably important where first situation in life where you just really don't have that data. And anyway, 
when it comes to human machine interaction, you usually don't have it enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In general, you don't have enough. So I think we've run run dry on questions in Discord. Does anyone want to unmute and ask a question? Because if we wanted to, Dorian, we could uh, tackle one of those um, high level questions that I had sent out earlier. Yeah, go, if you go wanted. crazy. Um, so I just dropped the the five things that I had brainstormed into Discord. Um, but maybe one of the, let's see, we already talked about a few of these. Maybe we could talk a little bit about how government and AI interacts because there's, there's been some, um, well, there, there are some people that say we need to get government regulations to make sure that bad things don't happen. Uh, there are other people that say, you know, this is such a fast, paced and innovative system uh, setting, we need to make sure that scientists and researchers have the maximal freedom to create these amazing things. The, the answer is probably somewhere in between, but I was, I was curious what, what kind of stance you had or, or what, what you thought if, if this was even a, 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 an important conversation to be having now. Um, I think, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a terrible answer. They both write, we absolutely need regulation it's absolutely a fast moving place where you just cannot put relegation the way you put regulation in other industries. So, so the answer is, is having fast adaptive regulation that makes a lot of sense. And, and more important than that is regulation that are not based on don't do that uh, as a sort of specific metric, but more like, uh, 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 it could be challenging. The supervised learning is now a lot more mature, but we're up to the point where there are a lot of things that you can put as regulation. So a good, I'll take the example that everyone knows, which is the bias in the data, right? Uh, if you're training an agent on anything that is a visual population, things like that, you need to make sure that your data is diverse enough so that you don't introduce bad biases, right? I mean, these are kind of simple rule that should be the regulation because I don't see anything positive coming out of not having a diverse data, honestly, right? I mean, even for cats, right? If you have an ML that is only capable to recognize white cats because it's seen only white cats as an example of picture, it's not a great agent to start with, right? So, so I think there are areas probably in visual supervised learning, which is a lot more mature in the machine learning field where you have already a lot of traditional relation you can put in place. So that's, I'm starting with the easy part. Um, the more challenging part is you have also things where it can easily get out of hand and become dangerous, right? Um, so a, a very good example is uh, paradoxically, even if we work in defense, I'd at the same time sign also the sort of general petition to not have any form of killer robots, right? Because I, I believe this is, this is a very bad use, for example, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I don't know if the US signed it. No, the US don't sign it. I think Europe, several countries in Europe did sign it. Uh, so, so this is leading to so much loophole from an ethical point of view that it, it should be a rule. So this is, now I'm talking about a higher level, high level, you should have regulation like this, right? In the same way that you cannot clone someone, right? You sh should just not have machine capable to do a uh, 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 sort of uh, deaf type of decision. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, and, and the problem is, so uh, 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 I'll tell you a true story that happened in Syria. Uh, uh, as you well know, China and Russia are investing a lot into AI applying to defense also as well. And they doing it uh, uh, with less ethical qualm than the European, I would say. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, a, a good example of that is in order to protect the zone, they had an automated turret that was just doing facial recognition. And so uh, I think it was doing facial recognition uh, and a couple of other things to determine if you're friend or foe and was shooting on site the good old Russian way. And uh, it was not perfect. It killed a few civilians. And I think it killed even a few uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, military, but they don't care. They're like, well, it's still doing its job. It's very efficient, very few casualty, but you know, who cares? It's, uh, uh, 
that's the sort of things we absolutely should not have right in general and sadly it's already starting to happen uh with a few countries and it's 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 think now of this put to a sort of drone assassin or thing like that is starting into enter into dystopia type of territory very quickly right yeah, especially in the the international stage where yes. it, 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 you get into very interesting international law and spheres of power and who can who can tell who what what is okay to do um, that's a whole nother level of, of complexity but then if so so let's say so uh, for you killer robots is a line in the sand I, yeah. I, I think I, that's a it's That's an easy a reasonable one. one. <laughs> it's yeah. an easy one. Yeah. I think I think many many most people would agree with that. Um, but then, if you are let, let's say you are developing technology, or I I'm doing research. I'm doing research on reinforcement learning, and then I realize actually my reinforcement learning research could be used for autonomous killer robots. Yeah. Do what are do I have any ethical moral responsibilities, or do I? How how do I as a scientist try to figure out what I should or should not spend my time on? So that's that's a very good question. It's a personal question, and interestingly, my partner and me, so Fabrice, who is my partner in this company, don't even have the same answer to this question. Right? Oh, interesting. <laughs> Which is very interesting. Yeah, I'm going to take an example. Uh, there are several major scientists involved with uh, figuring out nuclear, then the atomic bomb and everything that goes with it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is well known, his name is Einstein. Uh, the other one is just uh, 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 not in my head right now, but he was part also of the Manhattan Project. What is interesting is that for his entire life, Einstein regretted having participated in, 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 in kind of developing all the nuclear. Not, not the nuclear bomb, but everything that led to it, right? Oh, okay. uh, and which is very interesting. He had a very strong position, which was like, I, I, from an interrogate point of view, it's just like, I, I, I did something, I, I, I led upon a monster, right? As reversely, the other scientists who participated in the Manhattan Project who actually deeply regretted working on the atomic bomb, and I think he even uh, resigned at some point, spent most of his life uh, working on uh, nuclear energy and trying to find all the ways, I think he worked also on x-rays and other things, so basically medical and energy on everything that is not about killing people, but the reverse. Try to get to, some to, good out of it. To, to get the maximum good out of it, right? And. And interestingly, there is no right or wrong answer to that. Uh, I would, my partner is absolutely the Einstein way. He's like, if we're doing a technology that can lead to the sort of use, we should just fucking stop. And I'm more like, no, we should keep pushing it and try to use it for good at max as we can, right? Uh, uh, because otherwise you won't see a lot of technology development in pretty much anything, right? Uh, uh, I mean, you can see it with social media and how it's connecting and disconnecting people. You can see it in, in um, nuclear is a perfect example. We could wipe out the entire world or enter into a level of energy crisis uh, to, to no level. Uh, so it's, it's, it's yeah. I think every technology has the potential to be used in harmful and unharmful way, right? And what is important is not to not develop the technology, but to develop the technology and to use it really for good. And I would add something to that is with the current century that we're facing, I would probably add that you should try to make sure that you're using your technology to solve problem like climate change, climate problem like uh, water reserve, uh, problem like uh, energy, uh, and problem like human machine alignment, which I, I still believe is one of the five big ones of this coming century. So um, not all the students may know, know about this, but recently the NeurIPS conference, machine learning conference, required a, a statement about the possible ethical impact uh, or societal impact of their research. And a number of people were like, this is stupid, I'm doing math. It could be used for anything. Which, okay, I, I, can, I can see why you would say that. Um, but if you go, so I, I went and talked to some friends who do, did computer vision. 
And I was saying, you know, so when, when computer vision was coming, was becoming uh, hot and uh, uh, deep learning was making it incredibly more powerful, were people talking at all about how computer vision could be used uh, for oppressive functions? And, and, and the answer was basically, no, no one thought about it. No one thought about how our advances in computer vision could potentially cause harm. And that, that seems like a problem. Uh, you can, because I, I think I'm, I'm more on Dorian's side that you can, you can develop technology and it, develop it towards a good cause and somebody else could come along and uh, misappropriate it. But if you don't even think about where it could be used in a way that you don't want it to be, that seems like you're kind of, that seems uh, short-sighted. I agree. I, I agree. So here is my, I mean, I'm a big believer into open source community. I'm a big believer into general distribution uh, with overall, at least, you know, a more positive and negative view on human society, which you could argue right now we're everything going on is, is maybe optimistic. But uh, my philosophy is the following, is if a technology is put open source or out there, um, the good will kind of overcome the bad where you get into scenarios where you can have really bad usage is when it's actually only internal to a society, to a specific company, or to like, you know, specific AI named Skynet that only defends develop, for example, right? Those are good example of where you don't want it to be. But the moment the technology is really out there, people will figure out also counter to it, right? Uh, and, 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 uh, or try to, to, to kind of balance it. I think it will get balanced because it's out there. It is on the open source. And if it becomes a big enough problem, then people will be dealing with it, right? So, so I, I don't think it's necessarily a silver bullet, but I think open sourcing as much as possible, what you do, probably if you think that what you're doing can be dangerous, is actually the good way rather than keeping it proprietary. Interesting. Because one, uh, so one, a, a few news articles I read recently was talking about how the Los Angeles Police Department had been saying for years they were not using facial recognition, and then it recently came out that they had been using it for over a decade. At least that's, I don't know if that's true or not, that's what this one article was claiming. If that was true, and this technology was being used but they were not telling the public about it because we know that, for instance, facial recognition can be racially biased, that seems like a problem. And it seems Absolutely. like if, if you had that kind of transparency, that might help. Absolutely. And, and obviously, those are complex problems, right? And we entering into, uh, 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 okay, I, I'm going to do a little sidetrack, but sorry, I, I'm, uh, 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 there, is, uh, there is a professor I absolutely love. Uh, his name is Seplosky. He's a professor at Stanford. If you're ever interested into uh, uh, seeing things from multiple point of view, but what I love it, how he teaches is that he teaches you that every problem can be seen from multiple angles. And that guy is, is crazy. I mean, he's a, he's a neuroscientist, he's a biologist, he's a psychologist, he's an anthropologist, and three or four other things. And so he starts his, his, his lecture with like, uh, uh, for example, I'm going to talk today about schizophrenia, right? And so schizophrenia is a biological problem. And he explains you why, he tells you exactly what is happening with cortex and like that. He, he goes on for 10 minutes like, yeah, yeah, I'm convinced it's a biological problem. And then 10 minutes after he just goes, no, it's a psychological problem. So in this case, we have that person having the falling trauma, which led to the falling, falling, falling. And you're like, oh yeah, you're right, that might be. And then he moves to neuroscience. And then he starts to talk to you about a tribe in Africa and he looks at it from an anthropological point of view. And he keeps going like this, right? And do, and, and at the end of a, of a sort of lesson, you realize that, holy shit, schizophrenia is an extraordinarily complex problem that touches every different aspect. And in a very similar way as I'm happy, therefore I'm smiling, or I force myself to smile, which makes me internally more happy, human are really complex. And so when you think about society in general, you get even more of that complexity, right? Uh, and, and so open source, the reason why it's not a silver bullet is it works really well if your society is also well-educated 
if uh, people have access basically to technology information in a large way, if you have a society that is known and reputed to be highly transparent, if you have a society that values high health or value and things like that, if you keep on going like this, in short, I'm doing an open source project in North Korea, it probably won't change a thing, right? I'm doing an open source project in Norway, it will probably work really well, right? <laughs> That's kind of a conclusion I'm getting to. <laughs> So I think uh, we should probably wrap up here, but the, the final thing I'll mention is we are uh, at, at U of A, we are talking about putting together an undergraduate AI certificate, maybe an undergraduate AI major. And one of the things we're talking about is if and how ethics should be incorporated into that. Because right now, undergraduate compu computing science students do not need to have any training in ethics before they graduate. And that seems particularly important in AI, just like we've been discussing, and having some understanding of at least the ways to approach ethical problems or understand that, that, that they exist. And having, yeah. seeing case studies of where we've messed up. Um, I, I love it. And I, I think you should have that as early as possible, I think. Uh, honestly, the, 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 you know, people can do philosophy as early as their first year, right? So I think you can handle ethic as early as your first year. Uh, the second thing uh, is I found in the AI community, even within ethics, they tend to be two camps, uh, but I don't like having those camps. Or the camp that is all about, you should only look, you should solve the immediate ethical problems the one that are real, the one like the bias one, the one like the one on data privacy, because those are actual real problems and we need to solve them, right? And then you have a second one who is like, uh, the problems that are coming along in 10 or 20 years from now have such impact on human species that if you don't deal with them right now, we may just end up uh, you know, going in wrong direction as species. And, and, and here's the thing, you should not choose a camp, you should look at both. First, because camp one has an impact on camp two, and what you decide today has repercussion on what you decide tomorrow, and they're both important to very different reasons. I think we have today, we're already behind on regulation on AI, and there are a lot of bad things happening, and we need to have a good understanding of the development of ethic, probably with bias, probably with data privacy and some other fields, uh, and so people should be aware of that. And the human alignment problem, I think it's one of the big, best example of large problem. There are other ones also as well, are such complex problem and problem that when they arrive, you won't be able to think your solution out of it in a matter of weeks or even months, that you need to start to think about them now. So yeah, I would say go for ethic classes. Awesome. Well, I think that was a great capstone onto this hour, hour and 20 minutes. Um, thank you again, Dorian, for joining us, for telling us about AI Redefined and Cogment, but also for talking in very general terms about things that I think are really important that AI people often ignore, or at least don't talk about enough. So if, if you have time, I'm going to turn off the recording now, but then we, if you have time, well, you can stick around uh, for a few informal questions. But in any sure. case, I really sure, appreciate your time. Question. This was awesome. <laughs> no problem. My pleasure.